ओम ज्ञान ज्ञानांजन शलाकाया चक्षुरोन्मल तस्म श्री गुरव नम नमा ओम विष्णुपादा कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांता स्वामी इति नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्यदेशिणे वाचाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्रीअद्वैत गाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा so i'm grateful to be here with all of you today thank you gaur kumar proof for inviting me it's always a joy to be with you and a wonderful group of intelligent and thoughtful devotees that you have connected with and you are attracting so i welcome all of you today for joining am i audible clearly i think maybe you have to yes, mute yourself yeah, yeah. mm mm-hmm. so i will speak today on how the bhagavad gita structure complements its message as was mentioned in the introduction i am an author and one of the we could say challenges or curses of being an author is that you see everything from the perspective of an author now why do i use the word challenges or curses because what happens is the bhagavad gita is a book which uh, is a book of profound wisdom we consider it as a divine revelation and when we each of us we approach something from a particular perspective so for example if we go to a temple now most of us when we go to a temple we will go there to take darshan of the lord and we'll pray there we'll offer our respects but suppose somebody who is an architect who or somebody who is a, a civil engineer or somebody who is a who is in the building business they go there now what is going to happen is they even if they don't want to their mind is trained or conditioned depending on whichever perspective we take to look at the temple not just as a place of uh, devotion and prayer they're going to see it as how oh, how is this constructed and if the construction is done in such a way if it is done aesthetically if it is done appealingly so that the whole impact is when somebody comes in the temple then the focus becomes more and more on the sanctum sanctorum on the lord who is present on the altar then what will happen is they will appreciate the temple even more that their architectural vision will enhance their devotional appreciation in a way that somebody with a non architectural vision may not be able to appreciate however if the temple is not constructed so expertly then what happen is the architectural deficiencies or the architectural limitations will distract them from the devotional absorption or appreciation so in that sense it can be a curse if we are specialized in particular field then that can aid in our devotion or that can also impede in our devotion so i have been reading the bhagavad gita for the last 25 years and as i have been writing more and more and i have also been rereading the bhagavad gita i found that my vision and appreciation of the bhagavad gita have deepened and i'll try to share some of the reasons for that today 
So I'll have a PowerPoint and um, we'll also go to the Vedabase if required to look at some verses whenever needed. So let's begin with the Bhagavad Gita's core content. The how the Bhagavad Gita structure complements its message. That's the topic we're discussing. Now, what do I mean by the structure of the Gita? Mm -hmm. The Gita is a book. It has 700 verses, which are divided into 18 chapters. Each chapter is of a very, uh, the, the chapters are of variable length. Mm -hmm. There are two chapters, 15 and uh, 12, which are of 20 verses, the shortest. But all other chapters are of different lengths. So I'm not talking here so much about the number of verses or the division of the chapters, although that is also an interesting study. I'm going to focus primarily on the conversational aspect of the Gita. So broadly speaking, I will keep this in a format where I can use this as a whiteboard also to write some things. So I won't make it full screen. So we can say the Gita's three conversations, if we consider, there is the outer conversation, which is between Dhritarashtra and Sanjay. The Gita begins with Dhritarashtra's words. 1.1 is Dhritarashtra's words. And the Gita ends with Sanjay's words. 18.74 to 78 are Sanjay's words. So interlocutors are people who are having a conversation. So in the outer domain, the Gita's conversation is between Dhritarashtra and Sanjay. And what is the result of this conversation? Dhritarashtra is not transformed. He remains as it is. And we'll elaborate on this. You could say this slide is more or less a summary of what I'm going to speak today. But Sanjay is ecstatic. Rishyami cha mohur mohu, Rishyami cha puna puna. In 1876 and 1877, he says, I am thrilled. So we'll see why this happens. Then there's the inner conversation, which is usually considered the core conversation of the Gita. That is between Krishna and Arjuna. And <clears throat> this, we'll see where exactly it starts from and where it ends. But what is the result of this? Arjuna is transformed. At the start of the Gita, in the, by the end of the first chapter, Arjuna has put aside his bow in dejection, in confusion. He says, he says, Visrujya Sasharam Chapam Shokasam Vignam In 146, he says that it's described that his mind is filled with gloom, with confusion. And that inner confusion manifests as, out, as an outer decision. That outer decision is he puts aside his bow, saying, Nayotsyati Govindam. He says, I can't fight. So, but from that point, at the end of the Gita, Arjuna's bow has risen. He's ready to fight. I will do your will. So this is a transformation in Arjuna. And what about Krishna himself? Krishna's heart overflows with love. So the Gita is not just a conversation between two people. It is actually a conversation that brings two people closer to each other. In general, we see this, we can have transactional conversations. Okay, can you go there and do that? Yeah, I'll do that. No, I can't do that. Those are transactional. No, just a certain transaction happens. But there are some conversations which are transformational. Transformational, that means... They, no, they don't just transform our life in terms of giving us new direction, new vision, new understanding. But they transform even the relationship between the two people who are having conversations. Especially if it's a deep conversation about something which matters to both interlocutors. Then it brings the two people closer to each other. So Krishna and Arjuna, they come closer to each other through the conversation of the Gita. And the innermost conversation, which the Gita is meant to inspire, is the conversation within our own hearts, between the Atma and the Paramatma. So the Gita is not just a historical book. It is, of course, a historical book. It's a conversation that happened thousands of years ago on the Kurukshetra battlefield. But at the same time, the Gita is also something which is meant to be alive and active in our hearts. 
our body is like a chariot and we as the atma are present inside this chariot and then the paramatma is in one sense the controller but he is also the charioteer he is also the operator in fact krishna himself says this ishvara sarvabhutana riddeshi arjuna tishtati brahmayan sarvabhutani yantra rudhani maya just as it is krishna who is operating arjuna's chariot it is it is krishna who is operating our body now this is a big philosophical subject we may say i am operating my body for example i am speaking right now so i am speaking yes it is true i am speaking but i don't even know how i speak i just desire to speak and then my throat muscles they operate in a very complicated way to produce the precise sound that i want to that has the meaning which i want to convey so yes we we may have the intention to act but the execution happens through mechanisms that we have little understanding of so it is the bhagavad gita's philosophy explains that between us souls and our physical bodies the interfacing mechanism is primarily arranged by the super soul so by the supreme lord who is present in our hearts so in that sense the gita's setting is un- is is historical as well as universal it also reflects our being in our bodily chariot now what will be the result of the conversation between the soul and the super soul within our hearts that is up to us it's first of all do we participate in the conversation that you know krishna and arjuna were there but arjuna never consulted krishna initially but eventually he turned to krishna so so do we turn to the super soul for guidance do we take the guidance do we apply the guidance with all that is up to us and that result will determine our destiny so the innermost conversation is in one sense not a part of the text of the gita but it is very much a part of the context of the gita that is the intent of the gita that is the legacy of the gita so with this understanding now let's move forward to looking a little bit more at the way these conversations proceed Dhritarashtra speaks in the first chapter to set off the Gita's narrative, and then let's see where Krishna speaks. So, Krishna speaks in first chapter once. Uva cha partha pashyaitan samavetan kuruniti. So, at this point, Krishna only speaks half a verse. उवाच पार्थ उवाच कृष्ण से पार्थ पश्य एतान ओ पार्थ अर्जुन सी समवेतान कुरुनीति सो वी कुड से ओवर हियर एट दिस पॉइंट कृष्ण इज बेसिकली जस्ट डूइंग अ फंक्शनल रोल ही इज अ चैरियटियर एट दिस पॉइंट सो दिस इज व्हाट यू हैव टोल्ड मी टू डू यस आई हैव डन इट यू वांट टू सी द ऑपोजिंग वॉरियर्स यस आई ब्रॉट यू हियर सी इट नाउ सो we could say in this progression from 1.25 to 2.11 krishna's role becomes more and more prominent hmm. then by the second chapter what happens is arjuna has seen the opposing armies and he's overwhelmed at the prospect of the fratricidal war that is about to erupt and it's not just his relatives who are who are about to be killed among those relatives are his venerable elders specifically bhishma and drona and he just cannot stomach the idea of their death then what to speak of he being the cause of their death and thus he says i can't fight so at that time krishna so that is the end of the first chapter and krishna responds and we could say here krishna's mood is more of a comrade yeah. come on back up 
don't be fearful don't give up to this unmanly weakness he says that klebyam masmaga mahapartha klebyam is his weakness don't give into that so that's that's so just like if somebody is a little discouraged there is a big competition or a big test is there and before that somebody is discouraged you say come on this is not the time to be weak come on fight let's go ahead do this so oh, we could say at this level krishna is acting like a friend or a comrade hmm? and so but still that is a significant elevation from a charioteer now of course i'm not saying that krishna is not a friend of arjuna is always but within the gita's narrative krishna's role is rising hmm? and then arjuna retorts no i am not this is not weakness this is thoughtfulness it's it's not that i am afraid of fighting and dying it's not that i am afraid of bloodshed it's significant that throughout the first chapter of the gita when arjuna is saying that when arjuna is reasoning to come to the decision that i will not fight not once does he express fear of his own death so sometimes when a when a newbie soldier is there in a war in a battle actual battle they may just chicken out because i can't fight so arjuna was not like that he was a seasoned warrior he was courageous so if he was indecisive it was not because he was afraid of his own death he was afraid of doing the wrong thing he was wondering is is killing really worth it especially killing my relatives killing my elders is it really worth it is that the right thing to do so when arjuna insisted that that actually i am not weak i am confused and confused about the right thing then arjuna asks a question pruchami tvam dharma sammudha chetah in 2.7 he asks i want to know what is dharma i want to know what is the right thing to do so that question is universal and in answering that question what happens is krishna starts speaking wisdom so we could say here krishna becomes a counselor krishna takes on the role of a teacher of a guru krishna mande jagat guru and the first word that krishna speaks is that ashochanan vashochastvam pragyavadam sya bhashase gatasu nagatasu mscha nanushochanti panditah he says that arjuna you are lamenting for that which is not worthy of lamentation now this seems to be a very provocative statement because you know there are many things which we might say are not worthy of lamentation so sometimes uh, some people get completely infatuated with some mundane event say if some somebody is a big sports fan somebody is a big cricket fan and their favorite team loses and they may break down i was in canada and i met one person i was talking mentioning cricket in my class and he said that after that that he said that he became serious about spiritual life because he and one of his close close one of his, his closest friend they were avid cricket fans and i think in some sometime between 2011 to 2015 this was 2017 when i had gone there so he said sri lanka came in three world cup finals and all three it lost it was something like uh, t20 and other world cup whatever it was so he says there is there are a number of sri lankan fans who committed suicide because of that now it's interesting that none of the sri lankan players committed suicide it is the fans who committed suicide so now we could say at that time of course suicide is tragic it is no laughing matter but the point is he said that sobered me up you know there's something wrong with yeah although i was shocked that my friend committed suicide i was not shocked also in one sense yeah it was such a terrible thing that we lost so i said i felt my values have got skewed what is really of value i need to understand and that is when he started exploring spirituality and he was introduced to the bhagavad gita 
so we may say yeah you know cricket team losing is not worth lamenting we can understand that but here if somebody's loved ones are dying and they are going to be the cause of their death how can Arj krishna say that's not worth lamenting so in one sense krishna begins on a on a challenging note he says that it's what you, what you're saying is not worth lamenting but more importantly more than challenging krishna's message is challenging but it is also comforting it is also consoling because the point is not just telling him don't it's not worth lamenting he's actually going to explain to him a world view by which arjuna will understand how something is not worth lamenting and arjuna will become free from lamentation and it's interesting this word lamentation i i i even before i was introduced to bhakti i was a well read person reasonably i studied a lot of books but i don't remember encountering this word lamentation before i read it for the first time in the bhagavad gita you know we can we say that i feel sad i feel there's grief there is sorrow there is pain there is distress there is heartbreak but generally in common parlance we don't the word lamentation is not that common in general so i did a little bit study of this word uh, the history its etymology it's interesting the word lamentation what it conveys is something like don't cry over spilt milk the 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 implication of lamentation is that something has already happened something is irreversible or we could say something is unavoidable and then we are expending negative emotion on it that is the specific implication of lamentation hmm. so when krishna is telling arjuna don't lament ma hmm. shuchaha so the idea is that there are certain things in the world which are unavoidable hmm. and that does not mean that everything is going to go downhill and therefore we are destined to suffer and be miserable that's not the message of the gita if that were the message yes things will go down there will be distresses in our life and to some extent these are inevitable but if that was the essential message of the gita then krishna didn't even have to speak the gita he could just have said yeah this world is a place of lamentation you are lamenting okay message over now <laughs> he didn't do that so it's like somebody you tell somebody yeah you have a you have a terminal disease and the the disease is such acute level that no painkiller is going to work now go back home i can't help you you live in pain and then you die oh, i mean that's such a heartless message but the doctor may also say i'm helpless but that's not the gita's message what the gita does is that the gita helps us to decouple our consciousness from our circumstances that is you could say in one sentence the gita's formula for becoming free from lamentation what is that to decouple our consciousness from our circumstances now this decoupling is not because we are irresponsible it is not because we are apathetic it is not because we are frustrated it it is not because of any of those reasons but it is because of a philosophical understanding of how the world works and how we are meant to work in the world uh, but when we decouple our consciousness let me put it here i mean just okay uh, so how to be free from lamentation by decoupling 
our consciousness from our circumstances. To the extent we can do this, to that extent, we will be equipoised. To, to that extent, we will be able to move ahead in our lives uh, purposefully. This doesn't mean we become as I said, become apathetic. It means that there are certain go. Yeah. There are certain things which we can't change. There are certain circumstances which are unavoidable in our lives. And to the extent those circumstances are unavoidable, we accept them and we move forward. So the, so the Gita does this decoupling in many ways. And I'm not going to go into the core message of the Gita right now because we are focusing on the structure. But to quickly summarize, the first decoupling Gita does is by saying that we do not belong to our circumstances, that we are spiritual beings. Our circumstances are material and we are spiritual beings. The second decoupling the Gita does is that it says that actually we are meant to connect not with our circumstances, but with the Lord. Our eternal connection is the Lord. So it's not. And then third is that work according to the Lord's plan. So this itself could be a whole class, but as I said, I'll not go into that. But to quickly summarize, we are spiritual beings. So that's the base, first basis of circumstances that we are meant to connect with the supreme spiritual being. You could say with God. And we act according, act to do God's will in our circumstances. So that way our focus, even when we are trying to change we may want to change our circumstances, but our focus is not whether I am successful in changing my circumstances or not. Whether I am doing God's will, I am connecting with him or not. I am developing my relationship with him. I am deepening my uh, love for him. That is the Gita's message. So Arjuna, he understands that I am a spiritual being. Similarly, Bhishma, Drona, for whom I care so much, they are also spiritual beings. And I may take care of them. I may say, oh, I won't shoot arrows at them. I won't kill them. And I may think I am taking care of them by the way. But actually, far more and far better than whatever care I can offer them, Krishna can offer them much more. Because they are eternally connected with Krishna. And right now, they are in circumstances where they have to fight against Krishna. So, if I do Krishna's will, what is Krishna's will? Krishna's will not just that I fight in this situation. Krishna's will is that I establish dharma. And those who are, who are opposed to the rule of order and virtue in the world, those who will take the world to chaos and this misery, if I neutralize them, then by that, I will also free Bhishma and Drona to connect with Krishna better. And in this sense, he sees his vision of his role dramatically change. And does he sees that fighting will take him closer to Krishna? Fighting will take Bhishma and Drona about whom he is lamenting closer to Krishna. And fighting will set the world on dharma by which the world can go closer toward Krishna. So that is how Krishna talks about freeing Arjuna from lamentation. But let's not focus on that message right now. We'll focus on the point that Krishna tells Arjuna, you will become free from lamentation. So I talked about th three ways in which Krishna's role becomes more and more prominent in the Gita. And this can also happen to us. Mm -hmm. Initially, what happens for us? Yeah, God exists. Okay. Maybe we may not be atheists, but what happens is that God is, uh, he may not be non-existent, but he is irrelevant. He is inconsequential. When I, was in, when I was introduced to Bhakti, I tried to share it with one of my relatives. And he told me, that, yeah, yeah I, I believe in the existence of God. He is happy there and I am happy here. 
let's keep the status quo the way it is so so god is irrelevant but sooner or later just as arjuna faced a crisis the crisis we face may be different but whatever it is we we okay we had a particular plan this is what i want to do this is what i want to do and then suddenly some obstacles come and our plans just don't seem to be moving forward and that's when we start turning toward god now initially many people especially in today's world even when they turn towards the bhagavad gita if you search on youtube most people when they even you search on youtube for bhagavad gita you know people talk about bhagavad gita for peace of mind bhagavad gita for motivation bhagavad gita so the idea is we just want god to act like a comrade baka fight go on so we want god to simply be a encourager for us to do what we want to do and that is also good at least we are including god in our world view but after that so that may be the introduction to the gita for people but if they go further then what will happen is the gita is not just meant to act like a shock absorber for us oh i am shock some of the gita is help you to absorb the shock and move on with life the gita is meant to be a gold transformer not just a shock absorber so then we understand that god is who i should be connecting with taking guidance for not just what to do or how to deal with this problem but it is for what purpose to live so one is turning towards god for freeing us from problems but another is to turn to god for understanding what is the purpose of life and how to fulfill that purpose so the gita structure just as in the gita krishna's role rises more and more similarly in our inner world also in our, the uh, the importance we give to god can also rise when faced with life's perplexities then now let's look at the gita's three endings mm-hmm. now the gita has multiple endings here i am focusing on three places where where you could say krishna ends his message mm-hmm. and then i'll talk later about where the gita actually ends so the gita's ending happens at one level in 1863 where krishna tells arjuna vimrishaitad asheshena yathechasi tatha kuru okay now deliberate on what i have told you and then do as you desire deliberate and do as you desire so that is we could say at this place krishna krishna is more like a dispassionate educator sorry this not work krishna is like a dispassionate educator okay i told you this i told you this now do what you want to do sometimes if a doctor is treating a patient but the doctor is very afraid is very apprehensive that the patient may sue me because of some if some treatment goes wrong and the doctor may tell very very dispassionately again now okay now if you do if you do surgery for this particular you have this problem in your thigh okay these are the possible complications this is the cost and this is the trajectory for your cure if it happens now if you don't do the surgery this is what you will have to do this is the kind of pain you will suffer this is the kind of limitation you will have now you do what you desire now the patient okay thank you for telling me these options the patient says, what is your recommendation he said no no i no recommendation you decide really how do i decide i need something more so actually at this stage krishna is focusing on respecting arjuna's free will okay you do what you desire and this is actually the mood of the gita nowhere in the gita does krishna use his godhood to impose his will on arjuna if that's what krishna wanted to do then krishna could have finished the gita in just six words i am god obey me fight finished krishna doesn't do that so krishna is in one sense 
demonstrating also to us how we are to persuade others hmm. we have to appeal to reason and let people take responsibility for the decision hmm. and yet while this is one ending of the gita krishna doesn't stop here he moves forward in 1864 he says now i'll give you the most confidential knowledge sarva gohiyatam ambuya shrunu me paramam vacha he says now i'll give you the most confidential knowledge the highest of all the words that i have spoken and then there is manmana bhomad bhakto 1865 and then there is the charam shloka of the gita word ramanujare calls the crush jewel verse sarva dharman parityajya mam ekam sharanam raj says give up all other conceptions of what is the right thing to do and just surrender to me so this comes with a promise of protection what is that aham tvam sarva papebhyo mokshayishami ma shuchha now then he here we say he just now krishna was in the mode of a detached or dispassionate educator in 1866 do as you desire then why is krishna making such a insistent call just forget everything surrender to me so is there a difference between the two yes there is definitely a difference now is that difference a contradiction not exactly it's a progression not a contradiction it's one thing to not impose our will on others it's not it's one thing to not force others to do what we want to them, them to do but it's uh, it's quite another thing that if the other person actually wants guidance and we say no no it's your decision yeah i know it's my decision but if you were in my position what would you do no 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 i can't tell you that you just do what you want to do now see we will fail in our if we are meant to give guidance to someone if we don't share what we think is the best course of action then we are also failing in our guidance so what happens is at the end of 1863 after arjuna speak completes is if krishna speaks 1863 krishna observes that arjuna is suddenly lost deep in thought what should i do krishna is telling me to deliberate well there are hundreds of verses arjuna krishna has spoken in which verse should i deliberate on what is actually krishna's concluding message i want to know that and krishna and arjuna are very close to each other now when two people are very close sometimes even without words they can communicate with each other hmm? just through the glance just through the expression on the face they can understand each other so krishna understands that arjuna wants to understand what does krishna want him to do and therefore when krishna is speaking over here in 1864 65 66 giving a clear instruction it is out of love because arjuna wants guidance so he gives it so one aspect of love is to respect others free will we don't force others to do the uh, to do what we want them to do but another aspect of love is also we want to offer the best to them so based on our intelligence based on our experience if we if we know that a particular course of action will be good for the other person then telling them that is also an expression of love so here because it is krishna's love is being revealed so he is like a impassioned lover he says aham tvam sarva pape bhyo mokshayishami that sarva now generally speaking in writing Uh, it is said that avoid generalizations Avo- say for example never say never hmm? why because what happens is that n- there can there can always be exceptions hmm? in one of the early uh, writings that i had done hmm, in america some of you may be aware right now this uh, the roe v wade case is being uh, reexamined by the supreme court about the legal legality of abortion or at least the legality of the central government uh, dis, uh, of the court making the abortion a, a national federal issue instead of a state issue so anyway i had written an I written an article uh, long ago about how as a you know why 
why people want abortion is because they want technology to give them a uh, escape way from taking responsibility for their actions so we want irresponsible enjoyment so one of the senior devotees is only jayad white maharaj had reviewed my writing he said that is that the only reason is it not that sometimes you know there may be sexual abuse somebody might be raped so he says whenever you use the word never be very careful because now of course i am not going to the ethics of abortion over here but my point is that if somebody is using the word never or never or always these 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 words which have no qualification in one sense then it has to be very very emphatic and krishna uses these non qualified words twice sarva dharman parityajya sarva and he also uses sarva pape bhyo moksha ishami so sarva he uses twice so give up all your conceptions of what is the right thing to do and i will free you from all sinful reactions so generally speaking this is a very uh, very categorical assurance Gen no nobody will give this kind of assurance say if if we are traveling then we may take some travel insurance but during travel insurance there will always be conditions apply in this case this case the insurance will apply but krishna is giving an insurance that will apply at all times sarva pape bhyo moksha ishami so what is happening over here is krishna's heart overflowing with love is coming out over here and that's why this is a very ins it's a, it's a very inspiring verse it's you could say it's a inspirational ending of the gita and then the third ending is actually the textual ending the textual ending is where actually krishna's words stop and he says kachide tachrutam partha tvaye kagre na chetasa kachid agyana sammoha pranashtaste dhananjaya so he asks two questions he asks have you heard attentively and have you understood clearly has your illusion been, been dispelled now why does he ask this he asks this because krishna is not just concerned about delivering a discourse like sometimes there are paid speakers who come they just give a speech and then they will get their payment they go away krishna is actually concerned whether arjuna has understood clearly or not and the implication is if arjuna something you were not able to hear attentively now why this hear attentively is talked about mentioned because they are on a battlefield although everyone else is silent at that time when they are discussing because bhishma when he sees that these two are having a conversation bhishma says okay stop don't no attacking no noise over here let them speak so but still although the outer world might be peaceful but arjuna's inner world was turbulent arjuna was extremely agitated he couldn't even hold his bow gandivam shramsate hasta this is so arjuna was overwhelmed so krishna when he is asking have you heard attentively means what did the inner noise disturb you in your hearing and it's and then have you understood clearly so krishna is actually very uh, clearly expressing his awareness of arjuna's condition and his willingness to work with arjuna in his condition it is not saying that you know, oh you should not be disturbed i am speaking such an important message you should be paying attention now if you are not able to pay attention then i will repeat whatever is required so this reveals krishna to be a concerned mentor a dedicated mentor who who wants to make sure that a student understands and thus these three endings of the gita what do they do they reveal again different facets of krishna's personality 
So one is, okay, I'm an educator. I've done my part. It, generally speaking, if you want to, we want to persuade someone, uh, if you want to, if you want to get someone to do something, it's one thing we have to appeal to their head, appeal to their intelligence, but it's also we want to appeal to their heart. So in one sense, Krishna appeals to the head and the heart both. He appeals to the head by giving the analytical message with an analytic ending. He appeals to the heart by making a personal call. And then at the end of it, he further inquires, have you understood clearly or not? So this is how Krishna's rich personality, Krishna's loving and lovable nature is revealed at the end of the Gita. I'll conclude with one last point that it's interesting that after this, Arjuna says, yes, I have uh, my illusion is dispelled and I will do your will. So Sarvadharman Pratija surrender, Krishna, uh, Krishna tells Arjuna surrender, Arjuna says, yes, I will surrender. But the Gita doesn't end at this point. What happens after that is there are five verses spoken by Sanjay. So the Gita's ending is either Krishna's words, which is at 1872, or Arjuna's words at 1873. It is actually five more verses. So why are they necessary? Because they demonstrate the teaching of the Gita. In one sense, what are these five verses containing? These five verses express Sanjay's heart. So 1874, he says, he says, I'm so grateful that I got an opportunity to hear this extraordinary conversation. And then how was I able to hear this? Vyasa Prasada Shrutvan. So he expresses his gratitude towards his guru by whose arrangement he was able to hear this message. And then he says, I am remembering the message of Krishna. And I am feeling ecstatic by that. Rishyami Chamuhur Mohur. And then he says, I'm not just remembering the message of Krishna, uh, message of Krishna. In the message of Krishna, the, the centerpiece, the conclusion, the purpose is Krishna, the person, Krishna, the all attractive person who also manifested his magnificent universal form. So he says, I'm remembering that. And that is also making me ecstatic. So both the message and the person giving the message. Both of them I'm remembering and I'm becoming ecstatic by that. And the last says is there's a prophecy of the Pandava's victory. So why does the Gita end in this way? At one level, these words, what are they? They are indicating that there are different results of the Gitas. So as I mentioned, I talked about the inner and outer conversation. There is Krishna spoke the Gita to enlighten Arjuna and that mission was successful. Now Sanjay spoke the same, um, this same message to Dhritarashtra, but Dhritarashtra remained attached. He was not transformed. So he didn't immediately say, oh, Krishna is God. Krishna is so loving. Why should my son be fighting against him? Even if he wants to fight, I will not let him fight. It was not that Dhritarashtra immediately sent messengers tell, tell Duryodhana not to fight. No, he didn't do anything. He just continued hearing. So what happened is that he was not transformed. So we could say Sanjay was unsuccessful. Yes, Sanjay was unsuccessful. But though he was, so in one sense, the, the outer success was not there. But the inner success was there. What is the inner success? That in speaking the Gita, Sanjay learned more about Krishna and became attached to Krishna. Now, we all want to achieve many things in the world. And yes, we have energy, we have ability, and we are meant to make a contribution in the world. We are meant to make a difference in the world. At the same time, uh, whether our endeavors will lead to the desired results or not, is not in our control. But if we act using our God-given ability in a mood of service to God, then through our endeavors, we will go closer to God. We will become attached to Him. And that attachment to Him, that attraction to Him, that love for Him, 
that is an eternal gain whatever we may achieve in the world we may achieve wealth we may achieve fame uh, we may achieve even we may say okay i'm not just wealth and fame i made a positive difference in the world for all these people yes but even all that is temporary what is enduring is our inner connection with the lord so the gita for example talks about detachment karmanne va adhikaraste ma phaleshu padachana don't be attached to the fruits of your work and through sanjay's example the gita demonstrates that that sanjay himself is not attached to the fruits of his work and thus this is why i talk about how the gita structure complements its message that what it has taught it has shown it has demonstrated and detachment is not due to uh, frustration it is not due to helplessness it is not that it is not that suppose we lose something and i say i am detached from it no that's not the kind of thing which is we talked about here voluntarily giving up the okay, i'll skip this part here let's focus on this last part now so the la- in the last verse arjuna say uh, sanjay say yatra yogeshwara krishna yatra partho dhanurdara tatra shri vijayo bhutir dhruvani tirma tirmama so he said now yatra so he could have just straight forward said that actually uh actually who is going to be successful let's let's go back to this the gita's su- 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 symmetry is there so we can say that i said the inner conversation and the outer conversation the inner question between Arj- inner conversation between arjuna and krishna so the question was what is dharma and what is the right thing to do so krishna tells arjuna that mm. so uh, that the right thing to do is just do my will that is that is the right thing to do ultimately all the codes of dharma that we may have we may obey our parents be faithful to your country or help the child help the needy or whatever it is we may have all those be clean ultimately they are subordinate to the principle we are meant to do god's will so that is the right thing to do and the question which dhritarashtra sanjay was what happened at kurukshetra mamakha pandava chaiva kimakurvata sanjay what did they do and now the implied question was what will happen on the battlefield what will happen when the war goes forward what will happen to my sons hmm? so there is a indirect question say for example if we let's let's there's a cricket match going on and then somebody asks oh, what's what happened in the cricket match now they may ask what has happened in the cricket match but if they are very passionate about one particular team or one particular player then the question is okay is my team winning is my favorite batsman batting well that is the question so like that dhritarashtra's implied question was what will happen to my sons and in the same mode that dhritarashtra asks a question indirectly sanjay also answers that question indirectly he says he doesn't say your sons are doomed he says where there is krishna and where there is arjuna there will be victory now why does he say that he could even have said the pandavas will be victorious he could have said that even if he didn't want to say that the kauravas are going to be defeated or kauravas are doomed he could have said pandavas are going to be victorious but he didn't say that he said wherever there is krishna and where there is arjuna there is victory so why this because here the where the yatra can be both geographical and universal so sanjay is giving both a specific and a universal conclusion what does that mean that means at one level in the kurukshetra war it is arjuna and krishna sorry what happened it is arjuna and krishna who are going to be successful Uh, their side is going to be successful but if we go back to the innermost conversation of the gita which is between the soul and the super soul that where the soul chooses to be in harmony with the super soul where god and the divine and the human will become one there there will be victory that is the universal message of the gita now we could say that isn't it that wherever there is god there will be victory 
So because God is all powerful, God, God, where you now where the Narayan, there will be Lakshmi. So why does Arjuna have to be mentioned over there? Yatra Yogeshwar or Krishna, Tatra Shri Vijaya or Bhuti Rudkarvi. Why Arjuna has to be mentioned? Because the point of the Gita is not just to declare God's position or oh, where there is God, there will be victory. The point of the Gita is to change human disposition. That wherever there is God, there will be victory. Therefore, align with God's will. That is the purpose of the Gita. And that's the implication of the concluding verse. That where there is Krishna and Arjuna, there will be victory. That means where the soul chooses to align with the super soul, where we start becoming instruments for God's will, instruments for God's will, there we will be successful. So that is the conclusion of the Gita. And that is something which is universally applicable for everyone. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke about how the Gita's structure complements its message. And I started by talking about how as an author, as, as an architect sees a temple, then they will see it from the architectural perspective, like author. So I tried to look at the Gita from the structural perspective and beautifully structure complements the message. So in terms of structure, I discussed the Gita has three conversations, the outer between the Trashtra and Sanjay, inner between Krishna and Arjuna, and the innermost between the soul and the super soul. And the, in the Gita, Krishna speaks, we could say Krishna's speech begins at three places, 125, where he is speaking, where he is more like a charioteer doing Arjuna's will. And 223, two, two, where he is more being like a comrade. And then 211, where he starts taking on the role of a counselor. So Krishna's role becomes more prominent. And similarly, in our lives, when our plans are thwarted by the world's perplexities, then we may turn toward God more. And God's role may become more prominent in our lives. And when Krishna says this is not, not worth lamenting, what you are lamenting about. The point is, he is giving Arjuna a vision. The Gita's essential message we could say is that we can and should decouple our consciousness from our circumstances. And how do we do that? There are three things. We don't belong to our circumstances. We are spiritual beings. And our purpose is to connect with the supreme spiritual being, not control our circumstances. Then are we not to do anything about our circumstances? No, we act in a mood of service to the supreme to do, what we, to do what we can to make our circumstances better. But our purpose is not to change the circumstances or control them. Our purpose is to connect with the Lord and do his will. And then if Krishna, if Arjuna does Krishna's will, and Krishna is a greater benefactor of everyone, including Bhishma and Drona, about whom Arjuna is concerned. So that, uh, that message, how does it illustrate it towards the end? That we say, we are meant to connect with Krishna. What's so special about Krishna that we should connect with? That speciality of Krishna is illustrated in the Gita's conclusion. So the three places where we could say Krishna's message ends, 1863, which reveals him as a dispassionate educator. I have given your choices. Now you do what you desire. So here Krishna is loving, but his love is seen by how he respects Arjuna's will. But then because Arjuna sincerely wants clearer guidance, Krishna shows another aspect of his love. It is not just to respect others' free will, but it's also to want the best for those whom we love and offer them the best. So therefore Krishna says, Categorically, I discuss no qualification. Sarva dharma and parityaja, sarva pape bhimokshayami. It's a very emphatic, categorical guidance. So here, this reveals Krishna to be an impassioned lover. And then, last 1873 is Krishna is a dedicated mentor. Have you heard attentively? Did all the disturbances in your mind distract you? If 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 they did, I am ready to repeat whatever needs to be spoken again. So, such is the loving Lord revealed in the Gita's conclusion. And then after that, Gita doesn't end over there. Uh, Arjuna says, yes, I will surrender to you. But then Sanjay's words reveal the Gita in action. That sometimes 
despite our best efforts, we may not succeed. So Krishna's words transform Arjuna, but Sanjay's words don't transform the Dhrashtra. But Sanjay's words, speaking the Gita, transform Sanjay. He becomes absorbed ecstatically in Krishna's message and Krishna's form. And that connection with the Lord is the lasting gain which we all can have. And the, the symmetry of the Gita is that Arjuna's question 2.7, what is the right thing to do? Is answered in 1866, do God's will. And one point when the Trashas question, what happened to my sons? That's answered in 1878, that it's, they, are, they are doomed, but in answering that indirectly, the way the Trashas asked the question, Sanjay also gives a universal message that wherever the soul and the super soul align together, there will surely be victory. So that is the universal message of the Gita. And I sometimes put this message as, you know, be not apart, be a part. So be not apart from God, be a part of God. Learn to align with Him. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Aitanya Charan Prabhu. There's so many brilliant, wonderful points. It was sweet, it was subtle, it had structure, it had symmetry, it had a wonderful summary of the Gita. So thank you so much, Prabhu, for taking the time and being with us. And uh, we can see some people are clapping. And so I won't take too much time. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please uh, feel free to unmute and ask the question. Thank you. Yes, uh, Leka Mataji, please go ahead. Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh... Thank you so much. Uh, we feel very fortunate to hear from you every single time. Um, but I had one question regarding. So, uh, in the starting, you had you had uh, said something in the lines of when when Jivatma and the and God speaks, the output is a beautiful transformation. Um, is that the same as uh, surrendering? Um, if not, what do you, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on that? Like, how do we speak? Yes. Uh... The connection between us and the Lord, Atma and the Paramatma, it is a progressive connection. The surrender is, of course, uh, we, depending on what we mean by surrender, it can be the culmination or it can even be the beginning. If you see in the Gita, that move, that uh, words similar to surrender come thrice. Mm -hmm. It comes right in the beginning where Arjuna, Arjuna says, I'm surrendering to you in 2.7. It says, surrender. So, so surrender is the beginning of our relationship with the Lord. So there that surrender is not that I'll do your will, but I will hear from you. Okay, I've been hearing from so many other sources, so many telling me do this, do this, do this. No, I want to hear you. So this is, we turn to God for guidance. It's not necessarily we are going to apply it at that time. Hmm? Yeah. But at least, so that is also one level. Okay, mm -hmm. so at this time, you know, each of you could have maybe done your work, watch TV, read news, surf social media, but you chose to hear the Gita. So that itself is one level of surrender. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Then another place where the theme of surrender comes in the Gita after 2.7 two is 714, where Krishna gives the process so then we understand that actually, okay, I may be facing a particular perplexity right now, but perplexity, temptation, and all these are just a way of the world. Mm -hmm. And if I want to go beyond this, then surrender is the way. Now, what does surrender mean over here? Surrender basically means we connect with the Lord rather than obsessing over how to deal with the world. We have to deal with the world. But focus mm. first on connecting with the Lord. So for example, we begin our day with our devotional practices. Mm -hmm. And we pray to the Lord. We chant the holy names. We immerse ourselves in spiritual wisdom. And then we face everyday's challenges. Whatever challenges we have to face. So, so in one sense, 2.7 surrender is the, big, is the seeking of guidance. Mm. And then 7.14 surrender is the process for liberation. Mm -hmm. And in 1866, when there is surrender, that is, it is a call from the Lord. This is what you need to do to overcome whatever problems we may face. So for us as souls, whatever situation we are in, 
even if we turn a little toward the lord surrender doesn't mean that you know we just radically change our family situation professional situation something like that okay in my situation what can i do to link with the lord first so it could be just we are facing some critical situation in our life before trying to deal with that maybe just take a few deep breaths pray to the lord and then take a few step forward if it's a major decision then maybe consult somebody who is uh, who is consult a spiritual guide a spiritual mentor so if so surrender can come in many in terms of forms there can be many practical ways in which surrender can come in but the essence of surrender is we try to connect with the lord and then act does it make sense yes prabhu um Definitely. Thank you so much. Yes. Hare Krishna. Yes, Krishna. 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 think about it practically so thank you so much prabhu so i have like two questions uh first question is about uh, dhritarashtra where like uh, so you said that dhritarashtra was not affected in, in at the end of bhagavad gita but in mm-hmm. bhagavatam there comes this verse in like in i think 1.10 0.9 and 10th verse where it's mentioned that when lord krishna was leaving there was gandhari dhritarashtra all the pandavas and they all were like crying and they were not able to bear separation from krishna that's what that verse says so like i mean was the bhagavad gita had some subtle impact on dhritarashtra or he transformed later uh yeah so this is my first question prabhu and okay. and the second question okay, is let me, about let me complete this question first okay right. okay okay so now that's a interesting observation that it mentioned there that uh even everybody was lamenting when krishna was departing so in my understanding that there is to some level uh uh there is a possibility that there can be attraction toward the lord uh, because of the force of the circumstances the in uh, in the sandarbhas jeeva goswami explains that sometimes a devotee sometimes a devotee who may be a very new sadhaka that devotee may also experience advanced devotional emotions because of either the association of advanced devotees or because of a very devotionally surcharged atmosphere so sometimes even ordinary people when they go to a temple they feel oh there are some special vibes here what is this this i don't know where those vibes are coming from they may not even acknowledge that those are coming from the deities but they say this place has some vibes so similarly at that time the pandavas were because they were so intensely devoted to the lord and the followers of the pandavas were also quite devoted to the lord so there was a very intense devotional atmosphere that was created and it was that which which led to uh, having some kind of spillover effect that that had an effect on dhritarashtra also and because of that he was also lamenting that krishna was departing so there is no incident as far as i can remember in the mahabharat where dhritarashtra was ever averse to krishna it was just that he was too attached to duryodhan and that's why he he didn't or he couldn't we could say take krishna's guidance and we do see after that also after that incident also he continues on his attached ways it is only when eventually uh, vidura comes and chides him chastises him very strongly that he becomes enlightened so that was that at one level because the dhritarashtra was never offense directly offensive to krishna hmm? so the dhritarashtra we could say that he didn't stop and draupadi was being dishonored so is that offense well yes at one level yes but it was not he was directly doing it and he never he was never averse to krishna and krishna was revealing the universal form he asked krishna i want to see it that was in the rudra assembly so because he was not averse to krishna and because he was in a intense devotional atmosphere 
when the Pandava is feeling separation from Krishna. So that had an effect on him also. And similarly with Gandhari. Okay. Amazing, amazing Prabhu. Yeah, thank you so much. And so I had one second question also. Prabhuji. Yes, yes. So yeah. this is about, uh, about the recent incident that happened in Texas, Uvalde uh, town, like a uh, 19-year-old boy. He just... <clears throat> He, he took a gun, he killed his grandmother, then he went to elementary school, killed the like 19 kids, three adults, whoever was in the class. So, uh, I mean, Prabhu, what, is, what are your thoughts? So, that I have like I read some articles where like government is trying to figure out what they can do about this ban gun, do not ban guns, or it's, it's more of a mental health issue that is uh, uh, among the uh, these kids. So, um, I mean, how we can see this and like how we can think about this as a as a devotee as well and as well like or as a normal person mm. in both the ways. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah the Texas incident where so normal 19 kids were killed by a by a person who was who just went mad and had a gun with him. This is tragic, and uh, when a heart goes out to those who have been afflicted by it. And now one of the challenges is that we humans, when something terrible happens, we, we look for a villain to blame the situation on. So now are guns the problem? Are, is mental health the problem? Life is complex that it's not easy to find out, uh, to pin a complex event on a particular issue alone. Yes, we can say, okay, if guns were not so easily available, then this person wouldn't have done so much. Well, yes, that is true at one level. But at the same time, I could say that if somebody goes mad, you know, there were some terrorists who just took a truck, drove a truck into a crowded marketplace and they killed people. I mean, said, this is not a terrorist, this is a mentally disturbed person. Yes, that is true. So the point is that just blaming guns, is that the solution? No. Is blaming mental health the solution? Well, it's not a solution. People are mentally disturbed and they need help. So, so what has happened in today's world is that uh, in general, we humans have got far more power than what we can handle safely. Now, that is almost everywhere. That technology has given us access to a lot of power. Now, it's not just one form of technology. Now, people nowadays would say, uh, just to take a different example, is we consider social media like Twitter. Now, one person can tweet something which may be a malicious lie about somebody else, but that can destroy the other person's reputation. The other person may defend and refute and everything, but maybe the whole, the whole world may hear the lie and very few people will hear the refutation. So, so that is the predicament of the world we live in, that we have got access to far more power. So we have access to a lot of outer power. And in many ways, we can say we have lost access to inner power, the power to manage our own emotions, the power to manage our own mind that we have lost substantially. So now when we say mental health problems, it could be a pathological thing where some medication is required. But again, mental health problems are not uh, simply biological problems that a medicine alone will solve the problem. Medicine may help you to deal with the problem at that particular point, but there are overall sociological, spiritual issues. Ultimately, mental health comes when people have something meaningful to live for. Otherwise, there are different degrees at which mental health uh, problems start worsening. So there is no one quick solution for this. In general, the Bhagavad Gita talks about uh, uh, when it talks about dealing with the problems of the world, it talks about dharma at the social level. And it talks about bhakti at the individual level. Or you can say yoga, which culminates in bhakti at the individual level. That definitely dharma means, the word dharma, when Krishna says dharma samsthapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. What does he mean by that? 
there i have come to establish dharma means i am establishing order in the world i have come to establish order in the world so the idea is that there has to be order established in the world more effectively now whether that establishing of order means that uh, guns should be banned or there should be greater checks on who can acquire a gun or there should be greater security so that somebody with gun cannot come into places where they can endanger the lives of others that is something which is context specific you know that they we have to carefully consider the situation and uh, but the principle is dharma need, order law and order needs to be established more effectively but that is only one part of the solution ultimately every human heart longs for meaning purpose and ultimately love so the gita's 4.8 is about establishing dharma in the world 4.9 and 10 are about establishing prema bhakti in the heart so now we say bhakti is not just a particular uh, traditions way of connecting with god in a particular conception but it is it is helping the human heart find some higher meaning some higher fulfillment some higher love so that is something which has to be done that is not the that is not something which the government alone can do that is the individual's responsibility that is society's responsibility and that is what uh, we can contribute some steps towards you know wherever we are trying to raise our consciousness wherever we are trying to offer others resources for raising their consciousness to that extent that disconnection of the human heart with the divine at least to some extent that will decrease and in that way problems like this tragedies they can be minimized henry david thoreau said that for every one hacking at the shoot of a tree hmm a thousand such hackings better than a thousand hackings at the shoot of a tree is one hacking at the root of a tree so the root of the tree is that to the extent the we don't have a meaningful life the mind will make us do more and more meaningless things and some meaningless things will be will not be will be relatively harmless okay somebody just uh, spends a lot of time just mindlessly surfing uh, the net some people just drink and maybe drive and ha- uh, harm someone some people actually take a gun and out go outright and shoot someone so there are degrees of uh, of meaningless things which can be worse and worse but ultimately we need to have meaning in life so that hacking at the so we can look at oh this person did something terrible and that person did something terrible and we try to fix that it's important at a practical level to do that but that's like hacking at the shoot of the tree sometimes that's also required uh, circumstantially but hacking at the root of the tree means we need to sh- help individuals more and more individuals find meaning and purpose in their lives and that is what the bhagavad gita's wisdom can offer everyone and when that is done when the root is root of the tree of evil is hacked then such meaningless violence will definitely decrease okay okay so just one last question uh, kiran kiran please go ahead uh i think i think guru uh, raised my hand before me is it okay if i go first guru Prabhu, yes. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah. Okay. Um, Prabhu, uh, thanks very much for this wonderful class, uh, and 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 uh, thanks so much for spending so much time with us. Um, there was a point in your slides when you were mentioning um, getting free from lamentation by decoupling a consciousness from circumstances, and then you said that three steps, which are we are spiritual, meant to connect with God, and act to do God's will. I'm uh, sorry, God's will. My question is. Um, I think there is a very essential connection between lamentation and regret. Um and I personally believe that although we should not be lamenting about things in the material world we should nevertheless be regretful of some things because we're all living entities and we have to learn by our own by our own mistakes and if we do not if we just believe that oh this is just god's plan so be it Okay. we will never learn from our mistakes so what is the difference between regret and lamentation and how can we make sure that the regret is not you know going uh, towards the lamentation 
Um, yeah, yes, very no. good question. The difference between lamenting and regretting is the focus of our consciousness. That means when we are lamenting, it is more about what has happened. Oh, why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why does person do like this? Or why? Why? You know, I had this opportunity, but then the opportunity went away because because the maybe the interview was cancelled or this didn't happen, that didn't happen. So basically, in our functioning in the world, there are some things in our control, and there are many things not in our control. So when our negative emotions are focused or even fixated, we can say, on the things that are not in our control. and why they work out in an unfavorable way that is what we call as lamentation don't so uh, say for example don't cry over spilt milk the milk is already spilt we can't do much about it now we can say it is i who spilled the milk okay we need to learn from it so but oh the milk is spilled the milk is spilled milk is spilled okay it's already spilled now okay now why did i spill it maybe i was inattentive maybe i didn't maybe my hands were wet maybe i maybe you know the i filled the pot too much or whatever reason that we need to learn so when we talk about regret it is more focused on what was in our control which we could have done better but we didn't do so that is definitely taking responsibility so so we all need to take responsibility for our actions and then try to uh, Uh, improve our actions in the future so if we don't regret the some of the wrongs that we have done then how will we improve so regretting is helpful for us to improve but lamenting i takes our energy from what we can do now to what didn't happen right for us now of course so in that sense lamenting is undesirable now of course with respect to regret also we have to be careful that we at one level take responsibility but at another level we also distance ourselves yeah that was the past me that did it but i i have to take responsibility for it i try to try to do something to if i can to uh, to fix the situation but beyond that i shouldn't just keep beating myself up i'm such a terrible person that i did it so there's a difference between i did a terrible thing and i am a terrible being so i did a terrible thing is taking responsibility that is regret that, that is associated with regret but i am a terrible being that is associated with unhealthy guilt toxic guilt and that is quite damaging that is also to be avoided okay thank you so much prabhu guru prasad uh, yeah please go ahead Thank you so much, Pro Hare Krishna, Pro, and thank you very much, uh, uh, Vinay Pro, for sharing the link. I'm very grateful to be part of this August audience. Uh, so, Pro, uh, I just had a question. Actually, my question was with respect to, say, for instance, when you're speaking to friends and sh- like trying to share the Gita's message up to whatever we've understood, uh, there are certain things. Sometimes we want to. Sometimes people share certain deep realizations with us, and uh, we feel like, for instance, or they've read certain things, and I've and based on what i've heard i feel like you know maybe that's not the way we should be interpreting certain texts and i want to jump at, up at them and say no no that's not the way you should be, potentially do it and this kind of re- reminds me as what you had mentioned about what krishna does so krishna is also while he's just smiling and he's not sp- saying anything until actually arjuna really surrenders unto krishna and then krishna opens his mouth and it starts kind of speaking the whole gita so mm-hmm. i'm wondering how do i curb my tendency to like you know try to jump at them or potentially like i try my best but then it, sometimes it doesn't come out of practice what what should i be doing about this problem hmm so this is krishna doesn't speak unless arjuna turns towards him mm. so how do we curb our tendency to uh, to advise others yeah the two three different things over here first is that you know why do we want to give advice second is who we are giving advice and third is that when when are we giving advice when or how so basically the subject the object and the context the circumstance the uh, overall 
mood the interaction that's that's how relationships work there are three things in it the interaction the per, and the two people involved so sometimes uh, we may want to give instruction or we want to give advice because we want to put ourselves in a superior position you know, yes we want to show others how well I, how much i know and people can people can catch that soon that we were putting on a superior airs and what happens at that time even if what we are telling is right and good still they will turn off from that because they just not like the way we are speaking and that can be a problem so we can try to pray that you know i i'm yes i have some knowledge and based on that i'm sharing it but my purpose is not just to show uh, how much knowledge i have my purpose is actually to help the other person so we can prayerfully try to cultivate a um, cultivate a mood of helpfulness that's all we can do mm, from our perspective the second is that with respect to the other person <clears throat> the the nature of the mind is that it it often makes us believe that the wrong not only makes us do the wrong things but even when those wrong things are shown to be wrong the mind makes us put the blame somewhere else hmm? that means that it's not easy for people to acknowledge the need for guidance and especially guidance which will make them do something which is different from what they are doing right now so that's why it's it's uh, it's sometimes uh, more important to let them recognize the that they may be on the wrong track now we can always give some hints in terms of that maybe we have some maybe i have some insight that we could share or we could tell, indirectly tell that that we are available to help but generally speaking Uh, advice that is given unsolicited is not valued much so it just uh, puts people off and that's a that's not just other tendency we will observe that that is our tendency also mm-hmm. that now this is not always true because there are some areas where we may be aware that i am not so good i need to improve and th- th- there are people who are say for example they go and pay a coach to improve certain things that is where they have they are conscious that they are deficient but especially in areas where people are not conscious then rather than thinking that oh i have to help maybe find out in our social circles or wherever we are there may be somebody who will value our help and then focus on helping them hmm? in general in interact in our relationships if you put it that we um we sh- needn't overvalue the people who devalue us we don't need to overvalue the people who devalue us that means now if i am giving some good advice this person is not taking it why is he not taking it well if he is not taking that's their life just forget it don't overvalue their neglect of us but learn to value those who value us we'll find in our social circles there are some people who actually we spend time with them we talk with them we, they, they value the input but somehow because they value it so much we tend to devalue them but this person always there only so that the, the irony is that those who value us we devalue them and those who devalue us we overvalue them so so don't overvalue or devalue those who devalue us and learn to value those who value us so that way if we have something to share they they will benefit from it and a third is a context context means it's where do we share is it in public where they will feel shamed by it or they'll feel embarrassed by it or is it in private discreetly what tone we share it in and what is their frame of mind when we are sharing that that has to be considered this is going back to the earlier example of vidura and dhritarashtra now vidura tried to give good advice to dhritarashtra and many times dhritarashtra would solicit that advice and then neglect it he would ask what should i do it will say no no this i can't do so but what happened is 
eventually life brought dhritarashtra to a situation where he all his other hopes were shattered his it was his attachment to uh, dhritarashtra that was that was what i actually blinded him but when the sorry it was attached to duryodhan rather when duryodhan was killed then when vidura gave advice at that time dhritarashtra could take it so sometimes it's a matter of timing also so we will just have to be patient till the right time comes okay thank you very much prabhu thank you so th- thank, thank you very much you. for all these thoughtful questions thank you gaur kumar prabhu for inviting and insisting i had another engagement today which you insisted i should cancel so i'm grateful for that so thank you everyone for your thoughtful questions and let's pray that the gita continue to be our guiding light in our lives hare krishna shrimad bhagavad gita ki jai chale prabhu pad ki jai gaur bhakt vind ki jai